this is me. I'm a developer advocate at Redis Labs. Uh, here's my social information. You can go check it out. Uh, I've been a developer for, um, oh gosh, a lot of years, a couple decades. And I've been playing D&D for uh, probably a decade more than that. Um, and it's fun. And, you know, so this is me, right? Um, but this is a talk about Dungeons and Dragons and graph databases. And so I, I thought, you know, the standard, you know, Guy Royce developer at Redis Labs, social information, please follow me on Twitter stuff was, was uh, not enough. And so I thought I'd uh, share my character sheet. Uh, th this is me. I'm a Dwarven Bard, level five. Um, haven't, you know, I suppose technically I'm multi-class because I've been programming longer than I've been a developer advocate, which is sort of a Bard-like thing. Um, I've got my abilities there. You can see that I'm kind of average strength, uh, hardier than a little bit than normal. I'm fat, so I'm not very fast. Uh, I'm not very smart or wise, but my charisma is out of sight, which means that this talk will be all sizzle and no steak. So uh, that will level set your expectations for the content or for the talk. <laughs> um, and you know, as a D&D player, I've got a problem, right? Uh, I need to go into the dungeon and in the dungeon are the things that I'm looking for, right? There's a bunch of rooms and I wanna try and hit all the rooms that I can, or I wanna hit the rooms that make the most sense to hit. And I wanna figure out which rooms have the biggest monsters because maybe I want to maximize my experience points. I, I wanna farm the XP. And so I wanna to go to the room that has the big bad. But I also wanna maximize my treasure so that I can go out and up my gear so that I can get, you know, take my plus one sword and upgrade it to a plus two sword. And so this is a problem, right? Uh, how do I find the best path through the dungeon? How do I find the rooms to prioritize uh, with the monsters that I want to, uh, to get the XP from? And you know, I thought, well, I'm a developer in addition to a gamer. I'll just make a database with the dungeon in it and then I can query the database. And so I thought, well, I could do that with a relational database, uh, but God, that could be a monster of a SQL statement. Um, or I could check out this graph database thing and use a graph database. And so that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to look at ways that we can build a dungeon and query uh, paths through this dungeon and, and query things about the dungeon. And we're gonna use a, use, do it using a relational database and we're gonna do it using a graph database. And we're gonna compare and contrast. So you can kind of see how they work. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's an obvious question. What the heck's a graph database? Um, and and this, this is a good point for me to stop and say, I. Uh, I'm not an expert on graph databases. I'm not really an expert on anything. I tend to be a generalist, uh, but I am definitely a fan of graph databases. I just think they're neat. And so um, when we talk about what's a graph database, uh, keep that in mind. You know, so I, I can answer the, 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 the easy questions, but there's deep, deep questions that deep experts can answer that I, I can't answer. I'm not, I'm never an expert. I actually, I hate the word expert because expert says so much and it doesn't say anything at all. And, you know, anyone ever calls you an expert, I'm, you know, there's that sense of, but I'm not actually an expert. Why do they think I'm an expert? And the imposter syndrome kicks in, right? Um, but what's a graph database? Well, in order to understand a graph database, we need to understand what's a graph. Um, that's, that's, that's the underlying question. And a graph is a mathematical structure. Uh, it's made up of nodes or vertices and relationships or, or edges. Um, and it can represent lots of things. So this die 20 that we have on the screen here and, and the one I have in my hand is a graph. The vertex is the points on that thing, right? That's the point on this die 20. Uh, the edge is, well, it's the thing that connects all the points, the all the vertices together. And so you've got a vertices uh, and they're related to each other or connected to each other via edges. And, uh, you know, of course this works great for platonic solids uh, you know, polygons on a piece of paper, you know, you can think of it geometrically, but it doesn't have to be geometry. Uh, these can be as many dimensions or non-dimensional. Dimensionality is actually not really related to a graph necessarily, unless you want it to be. Um, they're really just nodes uh, connected via relationships or vertices connected via edges. Uh, the simplest graph is the null graph. This is a graph that has no nodes, and it has no edges, no vertices, no nodes, no edges, no relationships. There's nothing in it. Nothing to see here, move along. Um, so that's a boring graph. Let's go do something more interesting. 
uh, let's add some nodes to our graph. So now we've got um, here nodes A through G. Uh, this is a perfectly valid graph. It's just points hanging in space. There, there's, it's all vertices, no uh, edges. But it's still a perfectly valid graph. Uh, if you want to relate some of these things to each other, you can add some relationships. And now we've got something that's looking more of what we think of when we think of a graph, right? We've got some of these nodes are connected to each other. Uh, node A is connected to node C and node D. Node E is out there all by its lonesome. It's listening to Paul Simon saying, uh, no man is an island or something like that. Um, I am a rock, I am an island. That, that's node E out there. Um, and so this is more graph-like, but it's got some of these, this, this node E, he's, He's isolated, right? There's no relationships to it. It's just out on its own. And actually, uh, all the parts of this graph are isolated because they're not connected completely to each other. So uh, this uh, node B and F are isolated uh, to each other as well, they're to the, the larger graph as well. And even the big part in the middle, that's isolated too. It being big doesn't mean it's any less isolated. It just means it doesn't have a path connecting it to the rest of the graph, uh, to, to the rest of the uh, nodes. Of course, let's connect all the nodes. And now we have a connected graph. Uh, and a connected graph means that all of the nodes are connected to at least one other node. And there's a path from any node to any node. So node D can get to node F, whereas before it couldn't, and by way of A and B. So it's connected. You can also have a fully connected graph, where literally every node is connected to every node. Um, and I mean, that's sort of the. Uh, n times n minus one number of relationships in a network, right? You know, networks tend to work that way. I have a computer on the internet right now. It can connect to any computer on the internet. And so that's the number of, and every node on the internet can do that. So that's a fully connected graph. Um, this graph is undirected. What's undirected mean? Well, that means the relationships between A and B and B and C and, and all, of the, all the nodes don't have any, um, uh, direction to them. There, there's no directionality. Uh, so A and B are related to each other, but there's no additional information showing the direction of that relationship. To say that A is connected to B, but B isn't connected to A. A directed graph solves that problem. I mean, we just put arrows on them. That's all we do, right? It's just an extra bit of information on the graph. Instead of A and B related, now we know that A uh, relates to B, but B doesn't relate to A. And so it creates some directionality in that graph. It's a directed graph. Uh, graph databases, the, the ones we're going to look at, are directed. Um, when we're talking about nodes in a graph, uh, we can talk about degrees. Uh, the degree of a node is the number of relationships it has. If this is an undirected graph, then that's just the number of relationships it has. If it's a directed graph, it's the number of relationships it has in or out. So node A has a degree of three because it connects to B and D, and C connects to it. And we can subdivide that into uh, an out degree and an in degree, which is how many relationships we had heading out and how many relationships we have coming in. And so like uh, in our, um, our uh, fully disconnected graph, uh, all the nodes had a degree of zero. And here, we, we, some of them have an in degree or an out degree of zero. It's so like node F or node E even has an out degree of zero and an in degree of one. And so it's just a way of talking about uh, the degrees of nodes within a, in a graph. And uh, there really aren't any rules about how these relationships can work. And I kind of talk, talked about it earlier. It doesn't have to be a platonic solid. It, um, it doesn't have to map to any particular dimensionality at all. Um, we write them on paper because it's convenient, not because it's mathematically necessary. And so you can have nodes that connect to each other. So here we got A and B connecting to each other. Uh, you can have nodes connect to itself. So A has a relationship with itself. Uh, I, I guess uh, it's trying to be an island as well. Um, and so there really aren't any rules about what can connect to what. Now, there, there are rules, but um, not a lot of them, right? You, uh, you know, and uh, relationships have to connect nodes together. That's by definition what they do. But uh, they can connect to themselves. They can connect to the same thing multiple times. So A to B can be connected to B five times. Doesn't matter. No rules. Don't tell me how to build my graph. So that's what a graph is. A graph database 
is when we start laying data over top of it. So here we have a uh, uh, that same graph, but now uh, these nodes aren't just abstract letters. Uh, they're actually aspects of our dungeon here. We've got some rooms uh, that are in gray there. We've got some monsters in red. We've got some treasure uh, in gold. And so there's a little more information. We're laying some data over top of this graph structure. And in fact, uh, we can give each of these uh, things a label and attributes. And so uh, that first room there is the statue room because it's, it's got a property, an attribute of name, which is the statue room. Uh, it contains a monster uh, named Alice. It has a relationship to a monster named Alice, Alice the elf uh, with a challenge rating of seven and 350 experience points. And so uh, we can put these attributes on these nodes and uh, the relationships themselves can be labeled or, or typed. And so um, the room contains a monster. Uh, a room leads to another room. And so the, these uh, are extra data. So the nodes can have data and uh, the, the, the relationships can have data. And this is a uh, database worthy of Mordor, right? Uh, this this is how this is what a graph database is. It's that graph structure with data laid over top of it. Uh, the nodes and relationships in a database. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the nodes tend to represent items or nouns. I, I tend to think of them as nouns. Uh, they have labels and they can have attributes. They can actually have more than one label. Um, so a, a node could be simultaneously a room and a chamber, maybe, um, or it could be maybe a room and a corridor. You can, maybe, maybe you could do something like that. So they could be more than one thing. And uh, nodes, because they're nodes in a graph, can be all by themselves. They don't need relationships to work. The relationships uh, connect to nodes, and they have a type, like contains or uh, leads to. Uh, and they have a direction, which we, we've already seen. And uh, they can also have attributes as well. I generally don't put attributes on my relationships. I find if I have an urge to put attributes on my relationships, it probably means it's a node. Uh, that's been what I've, that's the pattern or the sort of the rule of thumb I've discovered so far. Uh, but the most important thing about relationships is they can't exist without a node to connect to. So uh, if you delete a node, like say you delete this vertex right here on this uh, die 20, then um, all the connections to it go away because there's nothing for them to connect to. By definition, a, a, an edge must connect two vertices. A relationship connects two nodes. And if one of those nodes goes away, the relationship doesn't exist anymore because the thing it would exist with is gone. And so those go away. Um, and so that's important when you, if you go deleting nodes, you're like, do I have to delete the relationship as well? Nope, that'll go away on its own, no problem. And uh, I think uh, if you think about these relationships, they kind of read like a sentence. I, I hinted at this when I said they're, uh, they're like a noun. And, and the relationships, as it turns out, are kind of like verbs. And so here we have a room uh, that contains a monster. So the room contains a monster, that reads like a sentence. You know, you got the, the subject, the sentence is the room, uh, contains is a transitive verb, and then monster is the direct object. The room contains a monster. Uh, you could actually flip this directionality and say the monster is contained by a room, uh, but then we're using the passive voice. And as my English teacher taught me, the passive voice is to be avoided. So we're not going to do that. Makes it more confusing. So that's the theory around graph and graph database. Let's uh, get into uh, uh, you know, the fact that we still have a problem that we want to solve. Uh, so Russell is asking, can a relationship have multiple directions, symmetrical, or would that just be an indirect relationship at that point? Um, you would just do a second relationship. So uh, uh, node A connects is got a directionality to node B, and then node B connects to node A. And those are just two separate relationships. And I, I think we're going to get some white noise in the background because my furnace just kicked on because I'm in Ohio and it's cold here. So apologies for that. Um, so uh, enough theory. We've still got a problem. And that problem is that we want to find the rooms with the monsters and the gold. And so how are we going to solve this problem? Well, we could do it with our relational database with the uh, tables and the joins and the rows and the columns or we can do it with a graph database with the, uh, the nodes and the connections and the attributes and the labels. 
And uh, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that you probably have used a relational database at some point in your career. Um, it's a really common paradigm. It's, it's you know, relate, relational databases. SQL is the only language that I used, that I learned in college, that I still use in my job. <laughs> All right. It, it, not a lot of them stick around that long, have that longevity. So relational databases are, are a thing. You've probably touched it. But um, when we do relational databases and when we talk to relational databases, when we query a relational database, uh, what we do is we uh, use SQL or SQL, depending on how you want to say it. I will say both. And uh, we've got a basic select statement here that's selecting all the rooms and the treasures and monsters they're in and does a join. All right, so this is, this is the language we use to query relational databases. To query a graph database, we're gonna use a query language you might not be familiar with. And that's called Cypher. Uh, Cypher is a, uh, well, it's sort of like the SQL for, uh, uh, for graph databases. And it's uh, in some ways has some similarities, but has a lot of differences. Uh, and the key thing that's different about Cypher is that it does this has this matching syntax. And so here we have the room that contains the monster. And this matching syntax is the part of uh, Cypher that kind of looks like a cross between a query language and ASCII art, for lack of a better description. So here we've got, uh, if we look at this little thing here matches a room, right? It's got parentheses, which are round, kind of like how we've been drawing uh, the, uh, the nodes on our, our diagrams. So those parentheses sort of suggest that roundness that we think of when we think of nodes in a graph. And the colon room part uh, says match a node that has a, uh, a label of room. And the R assigns it to a variable that we can use later. Uh, same thing for the monster. Here we're matching a monster. Again, you've got those parentheses, that roundness that suggests the node. Uh, we're looking for a label of monster, assigning that to a, a value of M. And in the middle here, we have an arrow, right? It's, it's got uh, square brackets um, for the type of that relationship. And we assign that, uh, that relationship to a variable C but it's got a little arrow there that shows you the directionality. So it, it kind of looks like the way we would draw this. And so it's, it's got that ASCII art like quality to it, which I, I think makes it frankly, very, very intuitive. And so, but this, this matching pattern is uh, a way of going through the graph and saying, walk through the graph and find patterns in the graph that match the pattern I provided you. That, that's why it's called a matching expression. Um, and so this particular match would match any room that contains a monster. And so if we had like say five rooms and five monsters and there's a monster in each room, it would give us five results. If we had a room that had five monsters, we would also get five results because we get the room and the monster for each one. And it would mat and it would mat those are all the paths or the, the structures in the database that match the, the match. So we're gonna look at uh, uh, CRUD operations, uh, the create, read, update, delete and how we would do that with a relational database and how we would do that in a graph database to show how Cypher works in greater detail. So um, let's look at creating a record. We always create first because uh, then we have something to read. So um, for creating a room, uh, we would have a room table which an, with an ID and a name. We've got our statue room as our first room, barracks and an armory. Every good dungeon starts with a statue room. And you got to spell armory with a U so that it feels British and therefore more Dungeons and Dragons, right? Um, and so here we're just doing a basic uh, SQL, a statement that does an insert, insert into the room, the columns we want to mess with and the values for those columns. Uh, this is uh, SQL 101. Uh, to do that same or do an equivalent operation in graph to insert a node, we use the create statement. So we create a node, notice the matching syntax. We're saying create a node. And by using the parentheses, it, it knows it's a node and uh, give it the label of room. And then we'll assign that to R so we can do stuff with it later. And that stuff later is set. And so we will we have a set and then we do a comma delimited, comma separated list of properties being set. Uh, one interesting thing here is that uh, the properties aren't baked into any schema. Graph doesn't have a schema. And so we've got an ID and a name that we're putting on this room, uh, ID of one, statue room, and this is the name. But we could add another property called is trapped or um, uh, contains uh, mold 
or, or whatever, whatever kind of dungeony thing you'd want to add to a room that would be a property, or maybe the size and square uh, foot, and square square feet, um, or actually being squares, right? This is D and D. The size in hexes, right? Because we're all doing hexes, right? Not. Um, but you could uh, arbitrarily add properties here. So there's no schema. Uh, but we create that room, creates a node. If we stopped there and didn't do a set, we'd have a, uh, a node that's got the label room and that'd be it. But with the set, it adds extra properties to it, or extra attributes. So uh, pretty easy. So how do we read that room? Well, in SQL, we use the classic select statement. Select columns from table where key equals value. And this would give us the statue room. If we want to get the statue room in a graph database, uh, we say match r colon room. And so this, again, we got this matching, this node. So match a node with a label of room, put it in the variable r. We, we did a create before, we're doing a match now. And then we use a where clause to filter out. Because if you think about a graph, if you've got a graph with say 20 rooms in it, r colon room is going to match all the rooms. And so we filter it out uh, to say, no, 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 filter that out. Just give me the rooms where the ID is one. Just give me the room number one. And then we can return it. We use return R. And this will return the node and its attributes. To update these rooms, again, on SQL, we have a classic update statement. Um, update rooms, set name equal to value, where ID equals one. Make sure you have the where clause in there. Otherwise, all rooms are statue halls now. In graph, it's it's actually very similar, and it's very similar to the previous one because again, we're going to do a match where we're matching the room where the ID is one, but instead of returning it this time, we're going to set a property on it, and so this would set or reset in this case the name to, from statue room to statue hall, and you could also add additional properties this way as well. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, everyone's favorite uh, form of file compression, deletion. Uh, deletion is 100% file compression. Uh, to delete uh, from a relational database, we delete from table where value key equals value. So make sure that where clause is in there or you're going to be restoring from backups. What? You didn't have backups? Oh, no. Um, in a graph, in Cypher, again, we're doing this match where. You see this pattern a lot. Match where, match where. Match this pattern filtering for value. Uh, but instead of setting a value on what we return, or instead of returning it, we delete it. And so we say match uh, r colon room where r.id equals one, delete r. That deletes the statue room. Bye bye. So that's your basic CRUD operations for, for nodes. And we haven't talked about relationships yet. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, but there's a note here I, I want to talk about uh, on nodes is uh, where. I'm using this syntax here where I say match r colon rooms where r.id equals one. Uh, there's another syntax you can use for matching that doesn't use a where clause and use curly braces instead and do sort of a key value pairing, uh, much like a JavaScript object, like a JavaScript object literal. And you're saying, well, well, you know, match a room that has this attribute. And if you can you can comma separate them for multiple attributes and get other things, no problem. Uh, that's another way of doing it without the where clause. And then you just follow up with the sets or the deletes or, or whatever you want to do. Um, and you can use this with create as well. Instead of creating a room and then setting the IDs, you can create a room with the attributes you desire ahead of time. And so then you don't need the following set. So hopefully that makes sense so far. This is just node manipulation. And when we go to do this with monsters, it's exactly the same pattern here. You can see that I, I instead chose to do the uh, the uh, the other syntax here uh, for the creations of monsters and treasure, but it's exactly the same process. We're just inserting re records, right? So this is what our relational database looks like so far. And uh, this is uh, what our graph database looks like so far. So let's do something a little more sophisticated. Let's. Uh, put a monster in a room. We're going to do that with a relational, and we're going to do that with graph. So if we put a monster in a room with a relational database, uh, we've got a problem. Uh, we don't have any way to do that. And so we have to alter the table. So we alter the monster table to, to add a new column to be the foreign key for the room that the monster's in. And here we're updating the monsters then to uh, set that foreign key. Um, 
uh, it looks like Bobby Ogre is supposed to be in room three, but it says room two. So ignore the fact that that's incorrect there. <laughs> but uh, so we just update that table. And this is a classic foreign key uh, structure that creates a one to many in a relational database. What's this look like in graph, in Cypher? Well, um, we're going to create a relationship between the nodes. And we do that uh, by matching. So we're going to match the node that we want to uh, the two nodes that we want to relate. So we're going to match the room for ID one and going to the match the monster with an ID four. So you can do multiple matches in your Cypher query. So now we have a variable R that contains room one and variable M that contains monster four. And then we create a relationship. We create that larger piece. Um, we say referencing that R that we used earlier, we say relate R to M with a contains. And here we've got that contains relationship and we, it's got the directionality. It's got the, all those ASCII art pieces that I talked about earlier. So this is how we put a monster in a room. And if we um, if we wanted to, if our rooms and our monsters didn't exist already, we could use this query here. But there's a temptation to think, well, can I just bypass that matching and just create things and say, match this, match this, and then create the thing in the middle? That doesn't work. What this query here does is it creates rooms and monsters with the same ID, because these are just attributes. And then it relates them together. And so if you want to use this sort of syntax, there's a temptation to use this because I'm like, oh, I'm just going to match these things and then create the new thing. It won't do that. It'll create new stuff for you. So you always want to match and then create the relationships that uh, you want to between existing things. If your nodes don't exist already, then this totally works. You can create a room ID of one and a monster of uh, with an ID of four and create them. And then you can create all three of those pieces in one fell swoop. Uh, putting a treasure in a room, of course, is exactly the same thing. We alter the table, we update the table. Uh, and then in the case of Cypher, we do a match and then uh, create a relationship there. And so this is our relational database so far. Now we have that wonderful one-to-many relationship. A room can contain many treasures. Uh, a room can contain many monsters. And this is our graph so far. We don't have a bunch of nodes that are all isolated now. Now we have little sections of the graph that are isolated. So uh, the statue room has a monster, the uh, barracks have a treasure, and uh, the armory has both. Exciting. <laughs> so uh, it's Munchkin time. We can start doing some interesting queries here, uh, both in relational and graph databases, where we can go and find the best, most monsters or find the most treasure. So if we want to farm all the XP uh, from a relational database, we just do a join. This is, a again, a classic SQL thing. I keep saying classic SQL, right? Uh, but it's a classic relational database move where we're going to select from two tables, matching that foreign key to the key of the primary table. So we're going to match the room ID to the room ID, uh, the room ID of the monster to the room uh, for uh, the room room. And then we return. Uh, are the idea of the room, the name of the room, and the XP of the monster. And we can order that so that the biggest room gets pulled out first. In graph, we can do something similar. Uh, we can match rooms that contain monsters. We've seen this pattern a couple times now, right? Uh, match a room that contains a monster. This will find all the rooms that contain monsters. It will return uh, the idea of the room, the name of the room, and the XP of the monster. And then we can again order. This is actually in some ways very similar to the SQL statement. Uh, just we're doing a match and a return, but then we're doing that order by so we can get the thing we care about most. And same thing for the gold, except a different table and different nodes. I, I had to put these here because I'm a completionist even though they don't teach anything new. But you know, it's like, ah, we got to show it all. Uh, we got to make sure we do the complete dungeon, every single room, right? So um, so far, so good, right? Uh, we've done things with graph that we can do with relational databases. But um, well, so what, right? So this is just another kind of relational database without a schema. Um, well, no, no, it's not. It's, it's actually something very different. And I actually think, I don't want to undersell the, the schema listness. That's actually can be very powerful. Um, but uh, we haven't done the really interesting thing, which is connecting rooms to rooms. Because a dungeon is a series of connected rooms that contain things that the adventurers want. So let's connect some rooms. And let's look at how we would do that with uh, a relational database. 
in a relational database to connect some rooms, uh, we need to create a new table uh, that has the room to room relationship, the connections between these rooms. And uh, so it has foreign keys for um, each room and the room it goes to and and then you know both directions it's actually got directionality built into it um and we just insert into that table uh the key two foreign keys of the rooms and now the statue room is connected to the barracks um but we had to create a whole new table to do this if we want to do this with cipher and this is i think one of the things that is kind of exciting about graph it's actually not any different than any of the other relationships we've established we match on the two rooms we want to relate and then we create a relationship between them and so we go out and get room one and we go out and get room two and then we say we create room one leads to room two and so now we've got uh, the related rooms this is no different than putting a monster in a room this is no different than putting treasure in a room you're just connecting a room to another room because it's all relationships there's no there are no tables there are no schema and so relating rooms is no different than doing those things. And so this is actually, there's, there's nothing new to see here. We're doing the same thing we've been doing all along. So here's our relational database so far. It's gotten kind of big. It's got four tables. Um, we've got a fun many to many relationship from rooms to themselves. Um, and then we've got one to many relationship for the monsters and the treasures. Our graph database is now connected. It's no longer got isolated pieces. And so we've got a room connecting to itself. We've got rooms connecting to each other. I, I kind of like how this works out because we've got the statue room, which is clearly the, the entrance to the dungeon. And it goes to uh, the barracks and the armory. But the armory has got a one-way connection from the barracks. So the barracks goes straight to the armory. And it's almost like, a, you know, it's like all the soldiers are sleeping in the barracks and they, they jump on the flagpole and they go down really quick. And then boom, they're on the armory and ready to face the threat that's coming into the statue room, which is the entrance to the dungeon. So there's, there's like a little story here, isn't there? Um, but yeah, this is our graph database so far. And so now we can be uh, not just munchkins, but super munchkins, because now we have the means to query rooms and paths through the dungeon. And in order to do this with SQL is hard because, well, how many times are you gonna join back on that same rooms table and the connections to you know, find paths through the dungeons? Uh, but graph makes it pretty easy and it does it using a uh, variable length relationships. So in Cypher, you've got this here that matches a room and this here that matches another room. And then you've got a leads to with a star. And that little star, that little asterisk means that um, make multiple hops. So uh, you can have a room that leads to a room that leads to a room that leads to a room that matches this pattern. A room that leads to a room that matches this pattern. A room that leads to another room 20 times over, that matches this pattern. And so it matches variable length relationships. Super cool. And it allows you to then find paths through the dungeon because you're, you're now you're querying paths as opposed to just one-to-one -one relationships. And you can um, specify how long you want these paths to be. So here you can specify the minimum number of hops, at least one, not more than three. And so this would find all the rooms that are within three hops of the current room you're in. So actually it would find all the rooms are within one to three hops of any other room in all its permutations through the graph, which would be a lot, right? If you've got 20 nodes in your graph, this could return tens of thousands of results. Um, and so we can use this capability to find things like nearby rooms. I'm in room one, what rooms are nearby? Here I'm saying I'm in room one, Give me rooms that are one to three rooms away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christopher. I appreciate that. It, it, I tried to make it fun. Um, and so, right, we're, we're, we're finding rooms that are nearby. What are, where are the rooms that I could go to? Which is kind of interesting, but it's even more interesting if we say, what are the rooms that are nearby with gold, <laughs> right? And so here we can match, um, a room that we're currently in, presumably we're in room one, the statue room. Uh, and we want to go up the three rooms away to any room that contains treasure. If it doesn't contain treasure, it won't match this pattern. And then we return the ID, the name, and the gold piece value of the treasure in that room. We return and we return those values. We order it by the gold piece value descending, which will give us the 
highest to the top. And, you know, for good measure, let's be focused. We'll limit it to one and that will just return us the room within three hops that has the most gold. So now we know where we're going next. Go into that room that's got that uh, 1,250 gold piece eye a gem that's uh, the eye in the big statue, right? So, so we can create these really cool uh, optimized queries. We can find the longest path through the dungeon. I, I, I joked earlier, I'm a completionist. This would give you the longest path in the dungeon. Give me a room that leads to all the other rooms and match that. And you might notice the P equals there. Um, that's, uh, that captures the path. Just like you do an R colon room, captures the room and puts it in a variable. The P equals cipher query or you know match uh, returns, um, the, stores the path information as a variable that you can query. And so we can get that path of every, the path from every room to every room. And then we can say, well, what are the nodes in that path? What's, what are the length of that path? And then we can order that by the length uh, descending, which would put the longest path that touches every room in there at the top of the list. And then we limit the one and then we find our longest path through the dungeon, which is kind of cool. Uh, so you're talking about using a, 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 a graph as a back end to a mud. Uh, I'm actually working on that on stream. <laughs> so I've got some code out there if you want to go play with it, it's if you like JavaScript. So uh, go out to my GitHub on Guy Rice and go check that out. So, uh, but yeah, you're right, Kevin, that's a great idea. <laughs> and, and you know it's a great idea because someone else thought of it. That's always the litmus test. So, um, so this finds the longest path through the dungeon. Uh, this will find the path to the room with the biggest treasure from where you're currently at. Oh, not from where you're currently at, but uh, fi find the room with the biggest treasure. This is new syntax. We can use a with, and this is a way of sort of extracting a variable from a match. We're saying, you know, get the max gold piece, and that tells us the max value. And then we can use that later in our where clause to filter it out. So find all the treasure, get the most valuable one, and then um, find all the rooms with treasure, filter it by that max value, and then return that one. And uh, most importantly, the path to the gold. This is sort of combining all the things I just talked about, where uh, we can find the most valuable treasure. We find the room that has that most valuable treasure, and again, with a match with. And then we get the path from the room we're in right now to the room uh, we uh, just discovered we want to go to and then we return the path to it. So we can actually do uh, really sophisticated queries here. So I've got about seven minutes left, I think. So I've got a demo. You guys wanna see that this is actually real? The, the answer is hell yes. <laughs> um, yeah, collaborative interaction fiction. And you know, actually we can do it instead of over the internet, let's do it in person, yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's take a look at this over here. Wait, hang on, there we go. So I've created a, uh, my apologies for looking to the side, but my monitor over here has the code on it. I've created a random dungeon generator here and I'm using a Redis graph for this, of course. And I'm using our cloud version because I've got a tiny little underpowered MacBook and we've got a big powerful cloud. And so I'm using that instead. Um, uh, so, uh, and this guy just generates a random dungeon. I'm just gonna go ahead and run it really quick because it's totally unimpressive. I hit NPM start. It runs and it pauses and, and it finishes. Good, it's done. Let's run, let's run it again. I think it had to spin up. Oh, there we go. So we've just generated a random dungeon. Um, so thank you for attending my demo. <laughs> just kidding. Um, and um, I, it's a whole bunch of JavaScript code, which I don't really have time to go into. Uh, and it's, it's not particularly brilliant. Uh, the main thing is, is that it's using, uh, in here, we're uh, using Redis Graph. There's a library for using that. Uh, it's called RedisGraph.js. And I'm using that to uh, uh, run queries. And so I pass in a, a Cypher query and I pass in the parameters and then this will return results from it. So this is kind of the interesting part. We can look at some of the queries here. Like here's where I create a, the dungeon. Here's where I create a room. And so this is the same sort of Cypher query we've been looking at. Um, and the fun thing is, is that I uh, use totally random, um, randomly generated uh, names for things. And so if we uh, go out to um, Redis Insight, which is a sort of a, it's a, it's a GUI client for Redis. Uh, we got one for graph. I can do, uh, I can go out and query this. So if I do match N, 
return n. That is sort of select star dot star, select star from the graph, right? This will just return everything. I hit enter and it creates this nice visual interface. This is going to match all the nodes and return them. And so this is my graph. I go to a tabular view. You can see we've got uh, uh, all the things that have, these are all the nodes. Most of, most of them just have names, uh, but not all of them do. Like here's- uh, Hi, Guy. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but we have five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got uh, Marla Vlin, the Displacer Beast with a challenge rating of 11 and uh, 66 experience points, uh, five giant rats. There's gonna be some treasure here. All kinds of fun stuff, right? Uh, but this view is actually kind of cooler. And so we can do any query we want, right? We can do match uh, r colon room that we'll do the, that contains um, a t colon treasure return r dot name t dot name t dot gp. So this will give us a list of rooms with treasure. Uh, look here, we have a minus one cursed lance. Who wants it? <laughs> um, and, and one of the cool things here is, that I think with Redis Insight in particular is let's match, let's go. I created a dungeon node in the, this generator, which wasn't in my uh, sample in the, uh, in the talk. And there's only one of them, and I know that, so we can safely return it. Here's our dungeon, right? The forlorn castle of Nucknog. Nucknog, that's a great name. <laughs> yeah, so all this code's up on GitHub. Um, and it, with uh, here, I can double click it. And come on, there we go. And now it shows me the, uh, this is the exit. And this is entrance. So we've got a red den. If we click on that, we can see that the red den has got three monsters and connections to two other rooms. So we can kind of walk the graph, walk the graph around here. And here is Grath Snar, the Displacer Beast. Here's our red chasm, which I guess is next to the red den. It's got a bunch of treasure, including the minus one cursed sling, chest of coins. And so you can kind of walk this thing around. But let's do one of the uh, interesting queries, uh, one of the big ones. And I'm going to cheat because I don't feel like typing this all in off the top of my head. Let's find the uh, shortest path. Let's, let's find the longest path in a dungeon. Now let's do the shortest path to the most gold. So copy that. And we'll just paste that up here. So uh, this is that big long query that I showed you last. And if I hit enter, uh, this is the shortest path to the most gold. Um, if we look at this at a table view, it probably is easy, easier to see. We got five nodes and we go from node zero, which is the dungeon. And then we go from this room to this room to this room to this room. So it goes from the dungeon through the entrance that makes the most sense and then finds the path to room five, which uh, has is the dusty stairs. If we go back to the node view, we should be able to look at the dusty stairs and see what treasures in it. Yeah, it's got uh, the minus one cursed lance and the axe of whatever, uh, <laughs> which is worth a whopping 2,500 gold pieces. So uh, yep, that's the, the link. And I have a link in my slides to it as well, uh, Derek, thanks. Um, so that's our, uh, that's our little graph here. Let me finish up the talks here, the slides here. So uh, this is a fun application, but there's lots of practical applications. Social networks are an obvious one. Hey, I'm friends with so and so. I follow so and so. This is this is these are natural graph problems. Genealogy is just sort of like a social network, but with your relatives and over time. Um, transportation networks are a natural graph. Roads and intersections are you know those are nodes and connections. And uh, for logistics, you can have lots of interesting problems with logistics where you're tracking like farms and trucks and stores and deliveries and all sorts of stuff. Uh, here's some resources to go check out. Of course, uh, uh, I would love it if you go check out Redis Graph, uh, uh, but you know um, there are other gra other graph databases are available. All these are open source. Uh, Redis Graph is completely open source. Redis itself, of course, is open source. Uh, Cipher query language was created by Neo4j. I can't talk about uh, Graph without talking about Neo4j. They created this query language we're talking about. 
Uh, so you go check them out, check that out if you want to know more about how Cypher works. Um, and then I've got a blog post here that I wrote in Graph, and just some useful resources to go check out. Um, I work for Redis Labs. Go check out our Discord server. I'm always hanging out on there, uh, and it has the word GM Kachu, so it kind of feels D and D. And here's our community forums and our Redis University link uh, for free classes. So go check that out. Here's the QR code that totally doesn't rickroll you, but takes you to the, this uh, URL, which has already been conveniently posted in the chat. So thank you. And that's what I got. I'm Guy Royce. Uh, please give me a follow on Twitter. I always appreciate that. Please go check out our stuff. And uh, thanks for attending my talk. Very good. We have a couple questions. Um, I guess we can go through and answer them real quick. Okay. Uh, first question is, what's the syntax to end a statement in Cypher? What's the syntax to, uh, let me see if I can look. The, the syntax. Questions. Go ahead, mm -hmm. sorry. Yes, it's in the question and answer is what's the syntax to end a statement in Cypher? To end the statement? Um, yes. I, it's just carriage return. <laughs> um, th there is no okay. uh, need to, like, there's no semicolon or anything like that to, that you need to end the statement, so. Okay, another one. How would you do the equivalent of grouping in graph? Example, if there were multiple enemies, there might be more XP in another room. Yeah, so uh, there's uh, several aggregation functions. I, I touched on one briefly towards the end there with the uh, with the with statement where you could say with like max XP. Uh, you can do uh, you can do a match uh, for say all the monsters in a room, and then you can do instead of max, you can do sum of the XP or sum of the treasure value. Uh, those would actually be better queries for the particular goal I'm having, but you know they also are harder to talk about, so they were distractions. So I didn't use that specific example, but it, it works exactly the same way. Okay, and another we have to do relation databases, not notograph our DBAs. How would you suggest responding to the RDBMs disciples? Um, I would say that uh, graph isn't the solution to everything. And so they, they may be right in saying, no, we don't want to do graph, right? Uh, lots of times relational databases are fine. Document databases are fine. Key value stores are fine. It really depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, graph databases emphasize relationships heavily. And so if you've got something that's really relational heavy, uh, it's a good choice. Um, and so uh, the, the argument, if you want to make a case for using graph database in your application is, is you know, you just need to find a justification as to you know, why do I want to use a graph database? Well, it's because I'm building a social graph. Okay, well then that's a really good reason, right? Um, if if your reason is is I think they're cool, well, well that's not really a reason, right? <laughs> I, I hope that's not your reason. I hope I didn't just insult you inadvertently. But um, I think uh, that said, uh, the metaphor for a graph database is really suitable for a lot of problems, and I think it's more intuitive to work with. And so um, if you've got a small to medium sized problem, that might be a good option. Um, and so it's, you know, you know, it kind of means the DBA doesn't have a thing to do with it. They don't, they don't have a thing they need to do, uh, which I suppose isn't make graph databases popular with DBAs. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so any other questions? Yeah, so following up on that same question, how efficient are the implementations of graph databases compared to mature ration, uh, relational databases? Um, I'd say uh, graph databases, the way they're represented internally, uh, makes them it makes them slower than a relational database because there's just I mean it depends on the query of course, but um, because of the way they're stored, you use uh, there's there's a couple different ways to store them. One way is really compact, but it's slow. Another way is uh, very fast, but it uh, takes up a huge amount of space, and so you end up with like uh, geometric increasing uh, uh, increasing of your space. And so uh, the way Redis Graph specifically does it is we use a sparse matrices, which is sort of a, uh, it's a balanced approach. And so most queries are pretty fast. Um, but uh, as, as you start getting like millions and millions of nodes, graph databases are gonna get slower. And uh, so if you've got really, really big things, it, it turns into an analytical database at that point, as opposed to an operational data store. Uh, for smaller and medium-sized problems, I think, you can, I think you can get away with using a uh, graph database for as an operational data store. But you need to have a good use case to, again, justify it, because there is a trade-off there. Uh, I could do some queries uh, against this graph that I created, which only has like 20 rooms. It's got maybe 50 nodes in it, uh, which uh, my little laptop can't run. So I very easily do queries like that. So of course, you can do that with relational databases too, can't you? So. <laughs> 
I hope I hope that answers the question. Okay, we have one more. How does one prevent type errors in a graph database? Monster leads to monster or room rather than room leads to room. Uh, well, you, you need to select. Um, so yeah, you, you, there's no reason you can't build a graph that has a monster leading to a room. Um, you could, or, or a monster containing a treasure. Maybe it was really hungry, I don't know. Uh, but uh, your code has to do that, right? Uh, so uh, it's schemaless. And so uh, that's just part of the territory. The short answer is you can't do that. You, you do that in your code. Um, in some ways, I said it's kind of like the schemaless versus schema is kind of like the distinction between strongly typed language versus loosely typed language. Uh, loosely typed languages, you have to take measures to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, where strongly typed languages do that for you. Similar for graph databases versus relational databases or document databases. Okay, one final question just came in. At scale, where ultimately everything can be connected to anything else, can Redis graphs be share, sharded? Uh, can you shard Redis graph? I actually, um, well, yeah, the answer is no, actually. <laughs> um, I haven't played around with that much, but uh, the graph is a single key in the Redis graph in the database. And so that key is going to exist on a single shard. So uh, sharding it, it doesn't work. You can replicate it. Um, that, that totally works. Uh, although I'm sure there's a whole ton of caveats there, just like there is with replication in general, just, just like replicating a hash. It's got a similar problem. Um, and so there is, you know, some subtlety there. But uh, no, uh, for sharding, the graph exists as a single key. Okay, 